Thanks, Julian. Thank you, everybody, for, for attending. Um, just check I can work this thing. That's right. Okay. Uh, before I sort of uh, launch into the presentation, uh, which will, by the way, not be a sort of uh, stuffy, sanitised corporate presentation, but a, uh, a bit more of a human presentation, given the, the venue and the time of day. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, we all get to where we are by a sort of... Uh, circuitous chain of events and uh, a while back I was working for a company called Apex Minerals which didn't go anywhere near as well as serious resources and prior to that Lion Ore and when I was at Lion Ore a certain bloke called Trevor Sykes gave me this book which, uh, which he wrote in and he said uh, Mark this will really teach you how to run a mining company <laughs> and, it, and this is now our corporate governance guidebook. <laughs> But uh, I, I think some of the trials I underwent with Apex, uh, lots of hard times, uh, taught me a lot of lessons, and certainly all of the shenanigans uh, embodied in this book uh, taught me lots of lessons as well, and it's those, those uh, hard lessons that, uh, that are the most important ones, I think, and prepare you best for the good times. Um, back in 2009, we put together serious resources, and we, at the time, I'll go into this in the detail of my presentation, but we put out a fairly, a fairly bold statement. Um, this was on our website, and I'll just read it to you uh, at the risk of, uh, of, of uh, repeating a few motherhoods. Our mission and vision was to provide order of magnitude returns on your investment through the discovery of high value mineral resources, through exploration and the identification of early stage assets. Um, the fo we're focused on commodities we know well, gold, nickel, sulphide and other base metals in stable jurisdictions such as Australia and Canada. As a junior explorer, we strive to identify those opportunities with high prospectivity and low entry costs, uh, maximise the money in the ground, minimise overheads, shorten the time frame to success by staying focused on the goals, exploring aggressively. Being in Balcata, which is a, a fairly dingy suburb of Perth, uh, reflects our philosophy, which is of uh, putting our money in the ground, not in the, uh, the, uh, the marble in the reception area. Uh, and also our aim was to really not just find extensions to things or other small things in well-known areas, but to really put, put it on the block, go out there and try and find the big ones and give order of magnitude returns. We gave ourselves three years to do that, and we found it in two years and 11 months with our last bit of money in the ground and our last ever drill program. Uh, the, we were able to do that because of a whole combination of things that comes together, part by design and part by chance, and I'll talk you through that. Okay. Um, just, uh, just to let you know, those who aren't so familiar with the story, where we are, uh, the Nova Nickel Deposit is situated in Western Australia, but it's not in the typical heartland of, uh, of nickel and gold. It's off to one side, east of Norseman, uh, just off the road towards Adelaide on the Nullarbor Plain, in an entirely new district that hadn't really been explored effectively before. Uh, that's the area there. And in, in terms of what it is, um, this is just a very uh, preliminary, cartoony uh, picture of what the mine will be like. But it's, it's a very large deposit, much more akin to the deposits you get in Canada rather than Australia. Those coloured blocks are, are colour coded on the basis of which, which year they'll be mined in, which will change once it's optimised. But those blocks there are between 50 and 70 metres high to put you on scale. So the stopes underground will be as high as a 25 storey building. It's, uh, it's a big deposit. Okay. Um, so. Probably 20 months ago, we were one of many small explorers based in Perth. Not much money in the bank. We had a couple of hundred thousand dollars left. Our share price is down at five cents, having uh, sort of uh, uh, been 20 at the, the, the last capital raising. There are a lot of investors hanging in there for uh, uh, reasons best known to themselves. Um, but the key thing is we had a good board that were uh, all... Uh, of the same opinion and the shareholders we had were supportive of us and we had last, one last roll of the dice. In July of 2012 we, uh, we made the discovery and since then 
Uh, we've done the drilling, put the resources together, done the scoping study, we're doing the feasibility study. It's now, as, as Julian said, it's a, a globally significant nickel project. Uh, the nice thing about it is often the devil is in the detail, and in this case the detail is, is, is as good as it can get. It's technically low risk, um, financially robust. It will be one of the lowest cost nickel producers in the world. Uh, we will be the last man standing in Australia. And uh, the product it produces is, will probably be the best nickel concentrate coming out of the country. Um, it's turned Fraser Range, which was once a backwater into Australia's hottest exploration province. We think we've got the best bits of that. Um, we've got the people in place now to, uh, to turn that into a mine and to keep exploring it because we've only just scratched the surface. Uh, on Monday we announced the appointment of Rob Dennis as our new COO who, uh, who has been, been there and done that and Rob will take that into production. And uh, like us, Rob is very cost conscious. We, uh, we want to run this business as if it's a private company, uh, totally dependent on its income rather than going back to the shareholders. And along the, along the journey, because of the, the market uh, reaction to, to what's happened, uh, we've been able to raise money and have 100 million cash sitting in the bank. So Sirius, it was somewhat unusual in that it was a, it was a tailor-made company, uh, a combination of a shell, the right ground, the people and, and the cash, and an alignment of circumstances. So what happened was... Mark Creasy was a, a major shareholder of Creasy's Mining, which went into administration. He recapitalised that and was a, a, a major shareholder of the, the, the Shell Creasy's post-administration. Uh, post, um, Apex Minerals had a nickel project that was surplus to requirement. Mark Creasy was also a major shareholder of Apex Minerals. And uh, we basically all got together and decided that... Uh, uh, We'd put Mark Creasy's private ground holdings into this shell. Uh, we would put the Lawless Project from Apex into this shell. We would raise money uh, and be a purpose-built exploration company going into high-risk, high-reward greenfields areas to, uh, to, to either do or die trying. So um, the shell was recapitalised in 2007. 2009, we, we, we put the company together. Um, I, we raised our first uh, tranche of money, which was $7 million, vended uh, three areas of marks into the company, which I chose, and uh, put the team together. In 2010, we raised a further $10 million and gave ourselves a two-year time frame from that point. We also redesigned the company capital structure so that should, should it be successful, it would benefit uh, optimally from that. So we, we, did, we had 12,000 shareholders that were leftovers from the old Croesus mining days. We, we got those down to about 4,000 with a compulsory buyback of un, unmarketable parcels. And then we raised $10 million, uh, did a 20 for 1 consolidation to tighten the capital structure up and uh, then did some more ground into the company at that point. And, and that was all done in one event and all of those things were uh, shareholder votes and they were all interdependent on one another. So it was all or nothing. Uh, it was all, uh, but that set the company up very well in hindsight. And as an incentive at that time to, uh, uh, for investors to, to chip into that 10 million, they received um, a, an option, uh, an un unlisted option that was uh, at 60 cents, uh, three times the, uh, the issue price. So it was quite an aggressive priced option. Uh, in hindsight, it was a very cheaply priced option for those people. But really what that did is it gave us a company that we could just go, we knew what we wanted to do, we could go and do it, we wouldn't fight battles with the board along the way with different objectives, we wouldn't have battles with our shareholders along the way with different objectives. Uh, obviously we have to take heed of the market, but not to the extent that we're forever chasing our tails. We had a time frame, um, an amount of money to spend and a clear objective and uh, that's what enabled us to just basically go about our business without too many distractions. And, and stick to, to our guns in, in the face of uh, a lot of uncertainty at times. And in the case of one of those projects we vended into the company was the Fraser Range joint venture. Why? Well, again, it's a combination of, of circumstances aligning over a period of decades, really. Uh, Tropicana had been discovered to the north of us. Um, it was known as a gold belt, but to the east, Parallel with it was a, a, another area that was less well known. 
Newmont and Western Mining had been in there in the 1960s uh, with the idea that this, this area looked a bit like the Thompson Belt in Canada, which was famous for nickel. Uh, they'd gone in there, had the right idea, done the right thing, but with the technology and the funds available at the time, just weren't able to, 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 to get to the finishing line, if you like. Uh, then Cambalda was discovered and everybody raced off to Cambalda and this was forgotten about for a while. Then one day Skylab came crashing down, uh, past the Fraser Range, and Mark Creasy went out looking for bits of it. And in the process of wandering around this area, it attracted his interest in, in the mineral potential. And uh, over the next uh, 10, 15 years, he began accumulating ground in the area. And the one thing about that, an important thing is he's a private individual, so he's not a public company that needs to get results tomorrow he could just slowly, slowly acquire and put the thing together. He's also uh, got, got the wherewithal to go out and explore it himself, so he did indeed collect 200,000 samples and probably spend uh, estimates for anything between 50 and $80 million of his own money just doing the legwork in the first place. Um, Mark got to a point in his life where he couldn't do it all anymore and reluctantly he wanted to vend this into a public vehicle. Unfortunately, it was the, uh, the one we were talking about. Uh, and that's where Sirius uh, sort of came into being. Also, and this shouldn't be under, underestimated, the government of Western Australia, like many uh, state governments around the country, did some uh, uh, data acquisition of themselves and made data available. So uh, without that, the junior explorer just wouldn't even know where to begin. Uh, it's only the domain of the big boys who sadly no longer explore uh, having the wherewithal to buy big chunks of data. So the government providing that data was a, a key ingredient. Now, in, in choosing bits of ground for Sirius, the Fraser Range was good because it did look like Thompson, as, as Newmont and, and, and Western Mining had recognised in the 60s. Outside of Sudbury, um, this is the biggest nickel producing area in North America. So there's one single belt that wraps around the, the ancient uh, centre of, of Canada there called the Circum Superior Belt and in one part it's expressed as the Thompson Nickel Belt and in another part as the Raglan Belt and, and with Falcon Bridge and Inco, uh, now Vale and Glencore Extrata, that was really the engine house of, of some of the world's nickel production. The Fraser Range is that, that bit wrapping around the southeastern edge of uh, Western Australia, and it's exactly the same. The same rocks, the same age, very little known about it. And that's what we liked about it. We just had a silly idea that, uh, seeing as it looks so similar, that it might have the same things there. So, that's a picture of Mark Creasy in his earlier days, when he went out chasing uh, space debris and he's sitting on a titanium uh, fuel tank or oxygen tank from Skylab. How, how he quite managed to find that in all of that bush, God only knows, but he did. But this is one of the, the key ingredients that, uh, that led to where we are now. Uh, getting on to the actual discovery, it's, it's really a, a, a sort of textbook story um, in that, as I've mentioned, the, the, the WA government release the data that enables us to pick bite-sized pieces from this huge area that otherwise would just be too much for us to even contemplate. Um, we did that, we came up with half a dozen targets. The government also did some regional geochemical sampling and that came up with a single point anomaly which I'll show you, which was another bit of encouragement. That caused us to, of, of the half a dozen targets we, we had, to go and uh, sample this particular one first and that is what is now NOVA. The government also co-funded a drill hole for us, which, which was a disaster, but was another key ingredient, as I'll go into. Uh, we then did our own drilling, our own geophysics, and uh, it was really the, the geophysics that was the final tick in the box that uh, led us to, to do that drill hole that discovered it. But there were lots of red herrings along the way. This is, this is the government data that they released. On the left is magnetics, on the right is gravity. Uh, the key thing there is the gravity. That big red blob is a slice of the Earth's crust that is denser than the rest and has been uplifted from deeper down. And that is the, the key area you need to be in to find the nickel. So if you're on that trend, 
you're in with a chance. If you're not, you're not. And fortunately, we, we had pretty well wall-to-wall -wall coverage of that, that ground at the start. The early, early work, um, it's uh, not always fun being first in at the pointy end. There's a lot of ground to cover. Living conditions are pretty primitive. And without, in a new area without data, there's nothing that we can go on. It's starting from scratch with a blank canvas, which can be fairly intimidating. The, uh, the, the government geochemical sampling that I mentioned, this is a map of it. The area in the middle is uh, that, that sort of eye-shaped feature is, is the geological structure that hosts NOVA. That's the government sampling. By pure chance, that sample in the middle is bang over the top of the deposit. There's one sample every 50 square kilometres, and if that sample had been that sample had been a couple of hundred metres either way, it would have never been seen. Um, and as you can see, it's not exactly rip snorting numbers there. There's 90 ppm copper compared to 40 or 50 everywhere around. That's the nickel uh, number in the same sample, so four or five times background and just one sample. And if you go into any government data set and look at these things, you'll find things like that all over the place. The, the difficulty after this was actually getting in there because this is dense woodland. You can see in that photo on the top right hand side, you can't drive in there, you can't even get a quad bike in there, you just have to bash your way in. So uh, being a small company with a small budget, um, we had a fairly basic camp as you can see at the top left and we employed three vacation students, one of whom was my next door neighbour's son to go in and do the soil sampling and in plus 40 degrees heat they would walk eight kilometres in every day, do a day's work, collect the samples and walk back again and it was those samples that uh, confirmed that initial slightly dodgy anomaly. This is our sampling now. And that's, uh, that's copper. You can see the, the red colours there are showing up a bit of a, a hot spot and likewise in nickel. So that whole feature was obviously an anomaly which gave us the encouragement to commit to the next, next round. We got co-funding from the government to drill a hole. Unfortunately, uh, this is one of those typical exploration stories. The, uh, in, in drilling these holes you need to provide water to keep water down the hole to stop the drill bit from burning. So that's the water cart on the right hand side, but it rained so much that the water cart got bogged and we ran out of water. <laughs> and Marcus, who's, who's shoveling the proverbial there, was doing that for two weeks. <laughs> that was his first job as a graduate geologist. Um, and as a result, you know, you pay downtime for these drill rigs even if they're not drilling. That, that drill hole cost us about $1,000 a metre and nearly, nearly broke us. Um, we persisted. A few months later we went back in and drilled a few holes and we, we drilled under this soil anomaly to see if there's anything beneath the ground. And there was a layer of nickel and copper enrichment, which was good, but there were no platinum group elements, which was a worry because normally you can get this sort of enrichment just through weathering of the rocks without there being an ore deposit underneath. If there's platinum there, it's usually a sign that there's some nickel sulphide there too, but there was no platinum, so this could have deterred us. Also drilling into the fresh rocks underneath, they weren't rocks that host nickel, they were granites. Uh, and we asked ourselves several times, should we actually be spending the shareholders' money drilling in granite looking for nickel? Um, but the one key thing was, Microscopic bits of sulphide, that's a thin section photo on the left hand side from the end of those photos, gave a tiny little clue that there would be nickel copper sulphides in the rock and that, that was enough to keep us going. We then committed to doing geophysics uh, and the top left diagram there, which is the important one, is the geophysical anomaly that was defined from that. Now normally with these things, the bigger the anomaly, the worse it is. Uh, this was so big that we didn't believe it was real and also, where we drilled across the top of that, we had no nickel or copper, so this could have been salty water or black shale or graphite or anything but nickel sulphide. So it would have been very easy to discount that at that point as well, but we drilled it. This is a, just a photo taken on the day of the discovery drill hole. That's a cross section in the field with some mud on it, showing uh, the surface as a line across the top and the, the supposed position of that anomaly and three, three holes we planned to drill to test it. The last three holes we could ever afford to drill. 
And if the rocks were such that they were too hard for the drill rig to penetrate that far, we wouldn't have got there and known about it. In hindsight, we've done some what-if analysis, and if those holes had been 20 metres in any other direction, we would have missed it as well. This, we, we sort of had a premonition that this was either too good to be true or it was the real thing. So we sort of kept a good photo diary of it, and these, these are photos taken on oh, the day before and the day. So top left, we were drilling away. Um, our geologist, Malcolm Gollan, is, is kneeling down logging the samples there. You can just see him uh, drilling through granite, the most sort of disheartening thing you can drill through all day. By 7 o'clock that, that night, we couldn't drill any further. We got to that target depth on the cross-section and nothing. We drilled another metre and we found the slightest bit of sulphide in the last sample. Malcolm was looking at it by torchlight in his sieve because we couldn't even see. That we had to stop. We had to spend the night in our, in our tent in the bottom left-hand corner, not knowing whether we'd, we'd have a company or jobs uh, the next week because we were all done and dusted. It was minus 7 degrees. So we sat around the fire sort of contemplating life, the universe and everything, and then resumed the next morning. Three metres later, we, we hit it. And that, that's when it all started. This, I, I refused to believe that it, it, it was the real thing, so I put the samples in my car, drove back to Perth that night, and that's a photo taken through the windscreen, driving back to Perth, which is a 10-hour drive along dirt tracks, uh, contemplating what may or may not be, with, funnily enough, Sirius in the sky above us. Um, and and then, then it hit the market, and, and the rest unfolded, and there are a few interesting things along the way. Uh, we were very proud that prior to this, there was, in terms of leakage of news, it was total radio silence. There was not one clue out there in the market that anything had happened. Um, and a particularly satisfying thing for me is, is, is a little story about the ASX, in that um, I lodged the quarterly report from Norseman on the way out to drill this hole went out of uh, email range, drilled the hole, we made the discovery. When I got back into Norseman into email range, I had a please explain letter from the ASX asking if uh, we could, uh, if we were able to continue as a going concern. So it was a bit of a conundrum because we hadn't made the announcement. I couldn't say why we were going to be a going concern, but that we were definitely going to be a going concern. Um, and in hindsight, uh, we were convinced ourselves what we'd got but based on the evidence we had at the time, it was a fairly bold statement to make. The, the heading of our first announcement was new discovery, new, de new deposit style and new district, which uh, is somewhat uh, uncompromising. Uh, but fortunately, it, it proved to be true. The, the morning after the announcement was released, I gave a desk presentation to, at a brokerage, and there were 50 people there, and there was just total silence in the room till the end of the presentation. And then they all, they all ran out and started buying PA. Um, then it got to the East Coast and there were a number of sort of technical fund managers on, on this side of the world and a couple of high net worths who, who are a bit more of a swashbuckling sort of uh, investment style and they, they piled in and that's what sent the thing uh, upwards. In all of this we were all very happy but Mark Creasy being Mark Creasy was, was his usual self and uh, we were sitting around the room zapping these samples with an XRF gun to get the grade and it was 6%, 7%, 5%, 4%. Everybody was smiling apart from Creasy. And, uh, and I said, come on, Mark, you've got to be having fun. And he said, the last time I had fun was in 1976. <laughs> when he had a holiday, apparently. Um, then it was diggers and dealers and I, I was standing outside diggers and dealers sort of showing the, 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 uh, the samples from the first drill hole. Everybody was very happy. This was 2012. Yep. Um, standing outside diggers and dealers um, with, with a, a gaggle of people around me. Um, meanwhile, out in the bush, the follow-up holes were being drilled, and uh, we had a junior, same junior geologist who, who, who shoveled the mud for two weeks, came in to drill the three follow-up holes, and every one was a duster. And he he was ready to slit his wrists. And I was saying, just keep your nerve, keep your nerve, and, and keeping the rest of the world confident that, that this was the real deal. Unfortunately, the next hole came in 35 metres thick, the next hole 70 metres thick, and it went from there. Um, I guess what, 
one thing we experienced was the weight of expectation of, of, the, of the world on our shoulders at that point. Uh, but once those holes were drilled, we felt we'd, na we'd nailed it, but we were always keeping up with expectation uh, with the market. So we then said, okay, we're going to drill this thing hard. We need to keep moving and ducking because there'll be predators out there looking at us. We've got to drill quickly. We've got to add tons quickly. So we mobilised a fleet of drill rigs and we were drilling 1,000 metres of, of diamond core a day, uh, which, which demanded a lot of logistics. And those options that had been issued in that previous capital raising two years before at 60 cents were suddenly in the money, so they were all being exercised and it became a self-funding exploration program, which was, which was great. Um, through all of that, did all the work. Last um, June, we released the scoping study. It's roughly 15 million tonnes at a couple of percent nickel, a percent copper. Uh, it contains probably 40% of the nickel that's ever been found in Cambalda, found in six months. Uh, it contains roughly half of the nickel in the ovoid at Voises Bay. Uh, it, at the rate of one and a half million tonnes a year uh, mining and processing, it will produce the best part of 30,000 tonnes of nickel, 10,000 tonnes of copper and 1,000 of cobalt. Um, we've got 20 or 30 people expressing interest in buying the product already. The initial mine life is 10 years prior to any additional exploration success. The key thing is because of the shape of this thing and the nature of it, it's a very low cost um, deposit. So C1 cash costs of about $1.57 a pound US, all in costs of between 2 and $3 a pound US. And even at today's depressed nickel prices, that leaves a very healthy margin. Uh, and that's the big discriminator between this and any other nickel deposit in Australia is, is the, the low real costs, not just the smoke and mirrors C1 costs. So when this thing gets going, we'll be in the lowest quartile of producers in the world. We'll probably be, anything, be somewhere between 10th and 12th biggest producer of nickel in the world. It's going to cost us uh, between four and $500 million to build this thing. Uh, we have a number of banks keen to, to fund it as well. So you, you can run any numbers you want. If you use current spot prices for nickel, you come up with one answer. If you use the, uh, the forecasts of nickel during the period this thing is forecast to be in production, uh, you, you come up with a num another number. So uh, Wood Mackenzie have recently upgraded their long-term nickel price to about $11 a pound. Short-term, it's going to be low, and that suits us. The more the others hurt in the short-term, the better. Um, at that sort of at $10 a pound and a 90 cent exchange rate, it generates revenue of about four and a half billion and a, a net cash flow of just under three. For every dollar per pound that the nickel price goes up, uh, it generates an extra 440 million net cash. Um, but again, irrespective of whatever the nickel price does, it's low cost and it's robust. So hopefully we can, we can finance this predominantly with debt finance. We would like to think that we uh, dilute our shareholders as little as possible, uh, that we're not too beholden to the banks. We don't want to be hedged because uh, why would you? And uh, dare I say it, at some point in the future, uh, this is the sort of rare asset that is capable of yielding a dividend. This is just a bit about the nickel market. How long have I got, Julian? Julian? How long have I got? Nickel's, nickel's pretty ordinary right now, and I wouldn't like to be a nickel producer with a high-cost nickel mine right now, um, but that's fine. Irrespective of what happens in Indonesia, there, there should be an upward shift in the nickel price over the long term. 40% of production is loss-making. Uh, some of that in the bigger companies is sustainable, but some of that in the smaller companies isn't. Uh, so there's got to be a structural readjustment at some point. And uh, our our timeline to production is somewhere around 2017, which happily is the time in which this adjustment is supposed to take place. Now, we don't just want to be a boring producer. We've got the, probably the best bit of exploration real estate in the country. We believe we've got the potential to, to have more than one Nova, and we're exploring aggressively. That's that gravity anomaly that I mentioned, and we've got a, a whole lot of ground spread along the, the axis of that. Um, this is the mining lease application containing Nova. We've got nickel sulphides immediately west of that, 
and uh, I think there's more detail here. In the first drill hole, we put three k's west of Nova. We, we hit nickel sulfides and the same rocks as Nova, which even the rock is very rare. So that you, you sort of uh, well down the path to finding something there already. Okay. Way down to the south, much earlier stage exploration. We're doing soil sampling. We've come up with a soil anomaly over an intrusion, which is every bit as good as Nova was in the early days. We've yet to do the geophysics and, and the drilling to see what may be under that, but this is, this is the best target in the Fraser range of anybody's outside of Nova. And then um, we, we announced only on Monday, um, whilst there's been a lot of, lot of wet weather there, we can't get drill rigs around at the moment, but we can get people around, we're doing soil sampling which is low impact and we can get in and out quickly. Uh, we had the guys down there doing this and we've come up with another thing called Centauri which is three kilometres south of Crux and again this is a kilometre wide soil anomaly, nickel, copper, cobalt, uh, you name it, that is uh, again every bit as good as the original Nova nickel anomaly. Just a soil anomaly right now but with the potential to be something more than this and again when weather permits we'll get the geophysical crews in do the geophysics and ultimately the, uh, the drilling to see, see what, what's here on, or not. This is 70 kilometres southwest of Nova, but with nickel sulphide, should there be anything here, this is eminently truckable to, to what will be a central plant at Nova. And that plant would be capable of treating anything from any of our ground and the only place in town for anyone else to, to come to as well. We've got another target 70 kilometres northeast of Nova, another similar intrusion. That, that, that diagram there just shows what no, the Nova host structure looks like inset and what the Bunningonia intrusion looks like. We just completed a drill hole there and got similar rocks there as well. Um, although we're a nickel company and it's all about nickel, we do have some residual gold ground. Off to one side of, of the nickel belt, we have what is the southern end of the Tropicana belt where we now have half a dozen big gold anomalies in virgin country. Those anomalies are up to two or three kilometres long and have never seen a drill rig, so uh, we're in the process of doing the first round of drilling on that. And 100 kilometres to the west is our other project, which is 100% owned. It's called Polar Bear. It's nestled in between um, the old gold mining town of Norseman, the gold mining centre of St Ives, owned by Goldfields, and uh, the, the Higginsville mine, recently owned by Avoca, then Alassa, and now um, Metals X. So there's 25 million ounces of gold surrounding us and 130 square kilometres of ground that's essentially unexplored in the middle of them all. This was our, our, our um, main project in the early days because it's a conventional target, gold in the gold fields and so on. Easy for the market to digest rather than scaring people with... with thoughts of running off looking for Canadian style deposits somewhere else. Um, this is always our top priority target but because it's under a lake and we were a small company we could never afford to wrestle those specialist lake rigs from the bigger boys around us to, because we couldn't offer them a big contract. So those targets sat there undrilled. Uh, since Nova now we have a little bit of money. We're only drip feeding this one but um, uh, we've started drilling those targets and that We've got three interesting areas. You can see from the, um, I don't know if that'll work. So that's the whole project area. There's targets running up through here. We've drilled this area in here. That's the expanded view of this. And here we've got uh, an accumulation of gold mineralization uh, about one and a half kilometers long. It's not an ore body, but it's a very strong expression that there may be something underneath and um, We've drilled up to 13 metres at 23 grams just in the sort of weathered portion of this zone. Who knows what this may become? Uh, given that it's surrounded by Norseman, St Ives and Higginsville, it's not uh, unreasonable to, to expect that uh, we could find another one. So just in conclusion about Sirius, um, our discovery cost for nickel has been four cents a pound. The scoping study is complete. The definitive feasibility study is on target for the end of June. We're not even bothering with a pre-feasibility study. There's no need. Um, it will be a, a globally significant deposit. It's, it's technically robust, commercially robust. 
it's in a good jurisdiction, despite the, uh, the, the Australia knockers, I'd rather be here than a lot of other places, believe me. Uh, it's going to be a low-cost producer. It's going to be a major world-scale producer. Uh, we've got the team to do it. Rob Dennis uh, is now in charge of the, of the charge towards, towards building this thing. Um, lots of exploration potential. Uh, $100 million in the bank that we can spend in various ways, which I'll come to. And, uh, and, and really, we're in quite a unique bubble, given, given the state of, of the markets in general and where we're at. We've been fortunate in our timing. Um, in November, we raised 80-odd million dollars at, at $2.43, I think it was. Uh, the, the intent of that was basically to be preemptive, not, not trade come issue, position ourselves with cash. We've got the cash to do the feasibility study, the cash to explore aggressively. Um, we're talking to Mark Creasy about potentially acquiring his 30% of Nova. That's been an ongoing discussion for a long time. Should that eventuate, then some of that cash can be used for that purpose. Should it not, then we've got a nice chunk of money in the bank to go towards the project development. Um, that's, that's pretty well where we're at as a, as a company. And, uh, what we don't want to do, though, as we grow, is, is lose sight of, of who we were. The, the culture is, is very easy to get swamped as, as a company grows, particularly as you go from an explorer to a miner. So we're very cognizant of that and put a lot of effort in, and we've actually been quite ruthless in terms of ensuring that the, the people with the right culture stay and get rewarded, and the people who don't have the right culture are, are taken out the back and shot. The, it's so important, um, you know, it pervades every, everything we do. And, and as a company, what we want to do is, apart from being the best nickel miner in Australia, we want to use that as a vehicle to, to show the rest of the world that the mining in industry isn't this demon, it can actually do pretty good things. Uh, engage the Aboriginal community, engage the local community at Norseman, uh, do more for the environment than we detract. And, and really use it as a benchmark because it's an exceptional asset and it gives us the ability to do that. And, uh, and we would like to think that that's what we're going to achieve. But to do that, we don't want to be like every other mining company. For example, to get our mining lease, we have to do a native title negotiation. Generally, you give up what you have to to get what you want. That's fairly, fairly transparent. If you show that you're prepared to do more than that, you'll get a good response and it'll pay dividends for everybody in the long run. So the sort of people we, we, we employ are the sort of people who have those, those values. And it comes, comes down to people being prepared to communicate. Anybody in our company can talk to anybody. They can call a spade a spade, and they do every day. Um, because often in, in a work situation, it's the things that don't get said that can do a lot more damage than the things that get said because people feel unable to speak their mind. So we make sure that everybody does that. To promote that, we have a fairly informal environment. We'd prefer to see our work environment more like Google than BHP. Uh, and as a, as a symptom of that, although we have been beaten to the punch with pink overalls, one of our, our desires is the last thing we want is to see our people turning up at Perth Airport in the same high-vis gear as everybody else, because if you want people to be to be good and different and to contribute, you don't want to make them all the same. You want to give them the freedom to express themselves and not be institutionalised. So, you know, we'd like to think as a little way of making that point, we'll have guys with pink overalls, purple overalls, floral overalls, paisley overalls, or Hawaiian overalls. Uh, and it's, it's a little thing and possibly a frivolous thing, but I think it, it's very symbolic of how you can run a company. We don't, we don't have to be all the same. And if you want to be better than everybody else, there's no, you know, if you start the same as everybody else, you, you're a loser for a start. So uh, that's the nature of our company. And it's very good because it attracts good people and enables us to hopefully achieve our objectives. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Julian.